and you have a nice arch to the eyebrows. draw any lips for the mouth and over it we place the lips. The upper lip is not entirely in shadow as it sometimes is. <coughs> and then a light half tone for the rest of it. The lower lip turns from its front plane to its under plane at this point. And the corner of the mouth is subtle. Okay, now we want to see the shadow beneath the lower lip, which is her lower tooth cylinder, and that overlaps chin here. And then we draw where the chin turns from its top plane, front plane, to its under plane. Okay, now we can go back <coughs> vertically to the main horizontal axis at the eye sockets. And we find the tear duct placed about here. And we place the tear duct here. And that's important because we know we're at the beginning of the eye where we find the tear duct. Then we want to very lightly, because it's not real dark or deep, we want to find how the bone of the brow overlaps the ball of the eye beneath it. Okay, can you close your eyes for a second, Chris? This gives us a good sense that the eye has dimension because you can see the half tone on each side on her left eye, and on the other eye, you can see the form shadow on the ball of the eye here. Okay, you can go ahead and open your eyes, please. <laughs> and then you can see the angle of the eyelid, which is diagonal in an upwards direction. And then here we can see the same. Now we look for the shape of the iris. One value. Remember, value <coughs> is the term referring to relative light and shadow, or re relative light and dark. The darkest value is black, the lightest value is white, and I'm using something of a middle gray here in between for my dark pattern. And we'll keep it that way <coughs> for most of the lay in phase of the drawing. Okay, and then we just pick up enough of the lower lid, which we see to be in shadow, and now we frame the head with the hair. Here. And complete the shape of the head. We pick up the side plane of the facial mass. Here. And then on the right side of her head, we pick up the same diagonal axis from the cheekbone to the corner of the mouth. Leave the lights on the skin, just the white of the paper for now. Alright, then we've got the hair on the forehead, and we have the outside 
of the hair and the silhouette of the head. And we have here the silhouette of her head. And now we pick up the shape of the hair framing her head. And then to complete the shape of the head, we pick up the cheekbone and the top of the head. And so on. Now the jaw. And then the angle from it to the chin. Here and here. The head is symmetrical, so find that form on the other side of the head. And then we can complete the drawing of the head. just one value. Cast shadow and a form shadow next to it. Okay, the ear. And then here the ear in shadow. Now the neck. Pit of the neck is here. And then the trapezius muscle behind the neck, here. And the half tone. On this side, the shoulders, of course, are <coughs> diagonal in their relationship. And then this is the angle of her left arm. And this is the angle of her right arm. And then this is the cast shadow over the upper torso from the head notice that I map it out before I apply the value so you're always measuring before you draw and then some half tones for the vertical plane of the neck we'll add the necklace later Now we see here the volume of the rib cage and the pectoral muscle turning from front to side in front of the arm. And then we can develop the shape of her arm. Biceps turning under there above the forearm. Here we see a half tone not to be drawn very dark, for it's not shadow, and then a hard edge conveying overlap in front of the torso. And we can develop some of these shapes. And since the arm is overlapping the torso, 
it makes more sense to draw the arm before we draw the torso. So here from the pectoral muscle, we get an angle to the hip of approximately this type of shape. And then here we develop a shape above the breast. And here we find the breast bone, the sternum. And here we find the pectoral muscle. Now to draw the breasts, we draw a relationship between both. And then develop the shapes. Complete the shapes with the cast shadows. And we can apply that simple and single value to the shadow. On either side of the abdomen. Now we want to find here the silhouette of the rib cage to the waist. And then here we can find the shape out to the ilium and to the waist, uh, to the uh, hip joint. And now we can cast a shadow under the breast. And then here we want to see the turning of the thoracic arch, cast shadow from her arm, and then here we find the side plane of the abdomen, which extends to the crotch. And here we find separation of upper from lower abdomen. here the navel. Okay, now the cast shadow from her arm and we complete the lower torso above the leg there. And here, if you squint you'll see that this plane falls off almost into shadow above the crotch. And here, the leg behind her wrist, overlapping the torso. And then the hand 
on the upper leg. The index finger. And then the other fingers behind it. Might as well group them for the moment. The thumb. Okay. Now we swing across her figure, finding the hip joint behind the hand and then the leg. to the gluteus muscle and the side of the thigh. And then on this arm, we see a cast shadow from the breast and the torso. And that extends down to the elbow joint. And then we'll draw this leg. Coming off at this angle. And then the seat in front of her leg. And then We want to place her hand on the leg and connect point A to point B at the wrist. And do the same beneath the arm. Would be here. And then the wrist at the radius bone, overlapping the flexor muscles beneath it. And then the hand extending out to the knuckles here. And the index finger here bottom of the index finger, and then the muscle between the thumb and the index finger, and the shape of the thumb. Fingers beyond simplified. That's all we need for the moment. Now we've got the knee, which is right beneath the finger, so we can turn that limb right here from the crest of the tibia down toward the ankle. And we can find the width beneath her knee here. And extending toward the chair. And then the front plane of the knee involves the condyle of the tibia here. And we've drawn toward the calf, toward the uh, ankle. Now we find the width of the ankle and then we draw an S curve
towards. And then in the direction of the ankle, we find the front plane of the calf muscle, the gastrocnemius muscle, here. And we've got the volume of the tibia and the muscle in front of it. Now at this point, we pick up the inside angle of the knee, her left knee, and we find beneath it, the crest of the tibia here. And then we find the outside of the knee joint, in front of her thigh. And then we find the shaft of the tibia. And then the outside of the calf muscle. And then the inside of the calf muscle. Looking back to the head, making sure we don't get too wide or too thin. And then come back in for the inside of the lower leg and complete the outside right above the ankle. Now we can finish off the thigh by drawing from the crotch behind the knee and by doing the same on the outside of the leg. Observe whether there is any important shadowing. Probably better to <coughs> take that entire inside plane of her leg and put it into shadow. It's simpler, makes it more legible. And then we have this strong half-tone slash almost shadow plane turning under to the crotch. Now the foot, um, Carlo, could you just slide the bench to that side so I can draw one foot? Just that bench next to you. You're fine. Just move it over. Yeah. Just slide it even farther if you can. Then I'll get both feet. Thank you. Okay, now on the last leg of this, which is the foot. And so we have a foot in profile. And that's best treated as a slipper, simple, simplified shape, like this. The other foot, from the ankle beneath the tibia, we get a straightening out of the direction. And then we get an abstracted foot that looks like this, out of which I'll carve the individual shapes in a moment. Let's go back to the first foot and find how the ankle overlaps the foot. And then get the instep here, the arch in front of the heel. Complete the shape of the heel. Complete the shape of the foot. And then we come out to add some volume here for the tarsal bones. And then we find the knuckle of the big toe. The foot can be up to a, a head in length. So I'm going to make it too small or too large. The lesser toes beyond. And here we find the inside ankle. Can't see the outside ankle quite, so don't draw it and then find the inside of the tarsal bones and come down from it to the ball of the big toe and find here the separation of the big toe from the toes beyond. And then pick up the, uh, the heel behind the, the, uh, the ball of the foot and then complete these other toes. Adding some convexity for the tarsal and metatarsal bones. So you've got the whole thing laid out, and I showed you last week how to. You can put in some kind of, a, of an environment.
just even the shadow she casts on the wall is enough to get some kind of a energy between the subject and its background. And that might apply also here. So we map out a shape, and then we just pick up behind her the chair, and then the angle of the drapery. And so we have centered, could have been a little bit bigger, but it's all right. We have our figure centered here. Okay, thanks Chris. You can take a 10 minute break now. And all I'll do during the break is just fill in any of those dark pattern shapes that I haven't gotten to yet and that I've only had time to measure. You'll notice I didn't stop and draw details. I kept summarizing all the time. And that <coughs> puts me in good position to develop the drawing from here. It's, we have all the table settings on the table, and now we can put in all the good little things. But first, get your summary. And I would also consider, since it's a long study, it's a nice pattern that she has on her robe, and so you can even include that on the uh, drapery over the chair. just kind of simplify that into a series of shapes. There's some black pattern that runs through out the whole row, and so that's a good, good place to start. You can still see some of my earlier construction lines. I didn't, as I constructed her figure, I did not erase them and scratch up the paper. Now I can erase them. But I just drew around them in developing the drawing. It wasn't necessary to have to scar up the drawing as the eraser tends to do. But that's why, I'm, especially now, I'm refraining at this stage in the class from putting in any real dark tones in the lay-in. I'm really being quite strict about that because that's the first thing people get off on the wrong foot with in a long study is they start putting in real deep black accents that they're stuck with. They can't erase them when they need to later. I won't bother to fill in all that pattern. You 